What are America and China fighting about, anyway? I just returned from visiting China for the first time since COVID struck. Being back in Beijing was a reminder of my first rule of journalism, if you don't go, you don't know. Relations between our two countries have soured so badly, so quickly, and have so reduced our points of contact, very few American reporters are left in China, and our leaders are barely talking, that we're now like two giant gorillas looking at each other through a pinhole. Nothing good will come from this. The recent visit by Taiwan's president, Tsai Ing-wen, to the United States, which prompted Beijing to hold live-fire drills off Taiwan's coast and to warn anew that peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait is incompatible with any move by Taiwan toward formal independence, was just the latest reminder of how overheated this atmosphere is. The smallest misstep by either side could ignite a US-China war that would make Ukraine look like a neighborhood dust-up. That's one of the many reasons I found it helpful to be back in Beijing and to be able to observe China again through a larger aperture than a pinhole. Attending the China Development Forum, Beijing's very useful annual gathering of local and global business leaders, senior Chinese officials, retired diplomats and a few local and Western journalists, reminded me of some powerful old truths and exposed me to some eye-popping new realities about what's really eating away at US-China relations. Hint. The new, new thing has a lot to do with the increasingly important role that trust, and its absence, plays in international relations, now that so many goods and services that the United States and China sell to one another are digital, and therefore dual use, meaning they can be both a weapon and a tool. Just when trust has become more important than ever between the US and China, it also has become scarcer than ever. Bad trend. More personally, being back in Beijing was also a reminder of how many people I've come to know and like their over three decades of reporting visits, but please don't tell anyone in Washington that I said that. There's something of a competition today between Democrats and Republicans over who can speak most harshly about China. Truth be told, both countries have so demonized the other of late that it is easy to forget how much we have in common as people. I can't think of any major nation after the United States with more of a Protestant work ethic and naturally capitalist population than China. Being back was also a reminder of the formidable weight and strength of what China has built since opening to the world in the 1970s, and even since Covid hit in 2019. China's Communist Party government has a stronger grip than ever on its society, thanks to its police state surveillance and digital tracking systems facial recognition cameras are everywhere. The party crushes any challenge to its rule or to President Xi Jinping. These days, it is extremely difficult for a visiting columnist to get anyone, a senior official or a Starbucks barista, to speak on the record. It was not that way a decade ago. That said, one should have no illusions, the Communist Party's hold is also a product of all the hard work and savings of the Chinese people, which have enabled the party and the state to build world-class infrastructure and public goods that make life for China's middle and lower classes steadily better. Beijing and Shanghai, in particular, have become very livable cities, with the air pollution largely erased and lots of new, walkable green spaces. As my Times colleague Keith Bradshaw reported in 2021, Shanghai had recently built 55 new parks, bringing its total to 406, and had plans for nearly 600 more. Keith, one of the handful of American reporters who lived in mainland China through nearly three years of stringent, zero-COVID policies, also pointed out to me that some 900 cities and towns in China are now served by high-speed rail, which makes travel to even remote communities incredibly cheap, easy and comfortable. In the last 23 years America has built exactly one sort of high-speed rail line, the Acela, serving 15 stops between Washington D.C. and Boston. Think about that, 900 to 15. I say this not to argue that high-speed trains are better than freedom. I say this to explain that being in Beijing reminds you that China's stability is a product of both an increasingly pervasive police state and a government that has steadily raised standards of living. It's a regime that takes both absolute control and relentless nation-building seriously. For an American to fly from New York's JFK into Beijing Capital International Airport today is to fly from an overcrowded bus terminal to a Disney-like Tomorrowland. 
It makes me weep for all the time we have wasted these past eight years talking about a faux nation builder named Donald Trump. On my first day in Beijing, I had a conversation with a young Chinese woman, a college student. Her first question, alluding to a book I wrote, was, Mr. Friedman, is the world still flat? I explained why I thought it was flatter than ever by my definition, which was that because of steady advances in connectivity and digitization, more people can compete, connect and collaborate on more things for less money from more places than ever. During my time in Beijing, I was struck at how educated Chinese people seem to be more connected and able to get around digital firewalls than before. I could see the woman wasn't totally convinced by my explanation, so we moved on to other subjects. And then she dropped this, I just used ChatGPT. I said, you used ChatGPT from Beijing, and you're asking me if the world is still flat. Indeed, a story making the rounds in Beijing is that many Chinese have begun using ChatGPT to do their ideology homework for the local Communist Party cell, so they don't have to waste time on it. It's funny, though, just when you start to worry about the state of JFK airport, and all the stories in recent years that China was going to bury us in the race to AI, an American team, OpenAI, comes up with the world's leading natural language processing tool that enables any user to have human-like conversations, ask any question and get deep insights in every major language, including Mandarin. <laughs>What are America and China fighting about, anyway? I just returned from visiting China for the first time since COVID struck. Being back in Beijing was a reminder of my first rule of journalism, if you don't go, you don't know. Relations between our two countries have soured so badly, so quickly, and have so reduced our points of contact, very few American reporters are left in China, and our leaders are barely talking.